So in this video, we're going to cover statistical inference and how we use null hypothesis significant testing to examine sample data. I'll go over real quickly the differences between research designs, commonly used research designs that we use in kinesiology, as well as the differences between statistical and clinical significance. So uh, the majority of the statistical analysis that I'm going to be discussing in this video largely depends on the distribution of data being normal. So this is a nice bell-shaped curve. is a normal distribution of data in which the mean or the median basically cuts the distribution in half. 50% of the distribution is below it and 50% of the scores is above that number. However, in reality, the distribution may be skewed one way or the other. So for example, here on the left, the median is greater than the mean because the lower half of the scores right here it tends to pull the mean in the negative direction or in the left side direction. So we call it negatively skewed or left skewed data. Over here on the right, the median is less than the mean because the scores over here, the top scores over here on the higher end of the scale tends to pull the mean towards the right or in the positive direction. So hence we call that positively or right skew. The degree to which the distribution is skewed ultimately determines how normal that distribution is. Why is that important? It's because as I mentioned earlier, the paradigm under which the statistical tests that we are going to be uh, covering and using uh, for the most part in research largely depends on the distribution being normal. Now, what we just did there, we used a histogram, we looked at the skewness, we could also look at the cortosis on the shape of the, the curve to determine whether or not it's normal. We could also use numerical methods such as the Shapiro-Wilk test, which is a commonly used technique um, that's available in SPSS or R or SAS, and that gives us an indication on whether or not the distribution of our data is normal. So th that category um, uh, or paradigm under which the statistical test is, is, is um, performed is called parametric statistics. And it's based on the assumptions that the distribution is normal, that the uh, data, uh, the variances in the data are equal, and the observations are independent. Um, as an aside, there are techniques that do not depend on the assumptions of distribution, of normal distribution, such as what we call these non-parametric techniques. I'm not gonna cover that uh, in this particular video. I have a separate video for that. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the way that we can assess the normality of curve is to look at the skewness and cortosis, or we can use a numerical method to determine that. So what is inferential statistics? The word inferential implies that the the test that we use, the statistical test that we're using, infers something about a certain population. Let's just say I'm interested in runners, some attribute of runners, whether it's BMI, their VO2 max, their heart rate, and the best way or the most complete way to examine um, these attributes in these runners is to collect data on every single runner in the population, which obviously is um, implausible, if not impossible, right? But the the scores or the variables that we measure from that population, we call that a parameter, right? From a statistical perspective, we call that parameter. More often than not, however, is we draw samples from that population and then we make these statistical inferences on what that population is doing based on a statistic that is measured and analyzed in that sample. So. Um, throughout this video, I'm going to use an example of comparing uh, running times, more specifically mile times, while running a, a cushioning shoe versus a stability shoe. And these are samples of, I believe I have a 10, 10 per group. So it's only 10, we draw a sample that we hope what we're seeing in that sample in terms of the, the behavior in the scores or variables that we're measuring is what the population is doing. That's why it's called inferential statistics. And you, you'll see a number of texts that use different um, mathematical symbols to denote, for example, the mean, the standard deviation, or the correlation. So this is what's used typically in the, uh, in the population parameters. And for the sample statistics, these are the counterparts, means, standard deviation, and correlation. So 
in research, specifically research exercise science, kinesiology, physical therapy, you name it, we use a scientific method, which um, involves developing a hypothesis and running a statistical technique, an inferential statistical test to test that hypothesis and determine whether or not that hypothesis um, is more probable than a competing hypothesis. Hypothesis is simply a statement of presumed relationship between variables and you as a researcher, as a clinician, as a coach have your hypothesis that you either um, induce from your own observations on the field or on the court or in the clinic or from available research from available data that's in the current literature. So how we determine this hypothesis largely depends on our experience. Now in um, developing or in performing these statistical analysis in scientific method, hypothesis driven research, uh, it's more than you know there are two specific types of hy hypothesis and I'm going to go over um, two of these. I, ha I know I have here three but really there are only two. Uh, probably the more important, most important one is the null hypothesis. What does the word null mean? I think you already know what that means, right? It means none, nada, nothing. So it is a statement that there is no relationship between variables or that there is no association between BMI and heart rate or there's no difference in mile times between shoe A and shoe B. So that is the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is the exact opposite. That is a statement that there is a presumed relationship between variables so that there is going to be a difference uh, between shoes or uh, between males and females in BMI. And the research hypothesis is whatever you as a researcher believes in coming in. You may believe that, you know, eight weeks of hit is going to improve someone's vertical jump height. That is an alternative hypothesis. Or you believe that there is no difference between ketogenic and paleo diets on someone's uh, body composition. That is the null hypothesis. So research hypothesis, although it's more common than not that the research believes in the alternative hypothesis, but there are cases in which the null hypothesis may be the one that the researcher selects. So it largely depends on the context. Okay, so we're going to cover uh, how we statistically test these hypotheses and specifically what we're testing is the null hypothesis. So there are a number of different inferential statistical tests in which we're trying to um, infer what the population is doing based on a sample that's drawn from that population. And it answers the question of uh, does the effect or the treatment, for example, exists in the population from which that sample is drawn? Is it real? Is that effect real or is it uh, something that happens by chance? And the probability of observing the inference in our sample is known as a probability of error, what some people call, like to call the p-value. Actually, it's, it's uh, known as the p-value. Um, and so it tests whether or not, or I should say, let me rephrase that, it, it gives the likelihood that the outcome that we get from our analysis exists in the population assuming the null hypothesis is true. The best way to to describe this, and I know that's a lot of information and it's it, pretty difficult to visualize. Uh, so let's go over an example here. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm looking at two groups of runners. One group of runners uh, wears a, a cushioning shoe, while another group wears a stability shoe. And I want to compare mile time. So this is a running study. And the question is, does running shoe type cushioning or stability affect mile times. So in this case, running shoe is the independent variable and mile times is the dependent variable. Um, by design, I, I randomly assign all these adult runners to two groups, uh, 10 in the cushioning and 10 in the stability. The null hypothesis is simply that running shoe has no effect on mile times or that mile times do not differ between cushioning and stability shoes. The alternative is that they do differ, that mile times do differ between runners who wear cushioning versus runners who wear stability shoes. So once you run the statistical test, and I'll go over the types of tests that we use uh, later on in the video here, it'll provide you what's called a p-value, which is the probability of error or the probability of observing a result that is either as extreme or more extreme than the result that you found in your study if the null hypothesis is true. Okay, that's a lot to kind of absorb right now, and then it's a little abstract and hard to visualize. The way you can think about it, remember, 
This is sample statistics. We're basing what we believe is happening on the population on the data and that is analyzed in our sample. This is a sample of, for example, 20 runners. So if there was no effect between groups or there is no relationship between variables, that's the null hypothesis. If that null hypothesis is true in the population, what are the chances that you will observe a result that is either as extreme than the result you get in your sample or more extreme than that? That's what the p-value gives you. And it's a it's a, a number that is between 0 to 1 or 0 to 100 percent. And we need to compare it to a criterion level to determine whether or not the null hypothesis, that no relationship exists between variables, can be rejected. Do we have enough evidence in our data to reject the null hypothesis? And that is typically set at 0 0.05 or at 0 0.01, depending on the context of the study. That is another way of saying that we're willing to accept 5% or 1% chance of being wrong, of getting it wrong, right? That the the data that we see or the results we see, we see occurs by chance in the population. Okay, so the best way to explain all of this statistical magic is with our example here. So we'll come back to our running study and we're comparing average mile times between running with stability shoes versus running with cushioning shoes. I have here a sample of 20 runners, 10 in the stability group and 10 in the cushioning shoes. The null hypothesis in this case is an effect of zero seconds. That means there is no difference in mile times between stability and cushioning shoes. In reality, you can choose any effect size you want. You can choose one second or two seconds, but for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to choose zero seconds. So we collect data, and these are hypothetical numbers. And we found that the uh, the stability shoe elicited a, a average mile time of 390 seconds, plus or minus 10. That's the standard deviation. And wearing the cushioning shoe resulted in an average mile time of 400, plus or minus the standard deviation of 15. That is a difference of 10 seconds. That means according to this data that running with a stability shoe results in a mile time that is 10 seconds faster. What we want to know is that effect size, that negative 10 seconds due to the shoe itself or due to some other factors in the population or some random fluctuations that happens by chance. So in order to answer that question, we need to figure out what the probability of error is, right? Remember, the probability of error is the likelihood of observing that result, in this case, negative 10 seconds, if the null hypothesis was true. If there was no effect of running shoe on mile time, how likely would you um, observe a result of negative 10 seconds? So let's let's break this down. So negative 10 seconds here, this is the difference in meal mile times. I almost said meal times, I said mean mile times. And let's just say, for example, I were able to repeat the study multiple times. In fact, you can use a computer uh, simulation um, algorithm to simulate or virtually replicate the study thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. And, you know, some places I'll get uh, negative 10 seconds and some instances I'll get negative 30 seconds. Uh, some instances I'll get uh, 10 seconds, positive 10, which means the cushioning shoe is faster. And then over and over, and then ultimately you see here that the distribution in that sample statistic resembles the normal distribution, whereas the central figure here, this value here, is a null effect. That is zero seconds. What we want to know is in our sample, negative 10 seconds, is how far away from the null is that score? And is it far enough that it doesn't really match up for what's happening in this distribution? Remember, inferential statistics is all about estimating what the population parameter is, whether it's a mean, standard deviation, or in this case, a difference in mean mile times based on our sample statistic. And our statistic here is the difference in meal mile times. And because I have the distribution, every time that we sample data, from that same population, we do so with a certain amount of error, with a certain amount of variability. And the variability in a statistic is known as a standard error. Now, real quickly, I want to show you this. That I'm sure you figured out by now that a negative number in terms of difference in mean mile times is, means that the stability shoe is faster, and a positive number represents that a cushioning shoe is faster. I think that's pretty straightforward. So as I mentioned earlier, standard error is a variability in a sample statistic. In this case, our sample statistic is a difference in 
mean mile times. It represents the fluctuations in our statistic, in this case, in a difference in mean mile times that is due to chance. So remember, we're, we're sampling data multiple times. If we were to do so, we would do so with a certain amount of variability. That variability can be measured with what's known as standard error. It is a theoretical construct because the only way to really measure that is if we collect every single, if we collect the data on every single runner in a population. It's not going to happen. So we can use a computer simulation to estimate a standard error, or we can use a mathematical formula, which fortunately, you know, the mathematicians already came up with a formula for looking at two groups uh, with, you know, have standard deviation and a sample size. So uh, depending on which class you're taking with me, I may or may not have you calculate the standard error manually, but you can see here it's pretty straightforward. It is a function of the square of the standard deviation within each group divided by the respective sample size. You add those up, take the square root, you get a standard error of 5.7 in this case, right? So that represents the error in which we're sampling the statistic, which is the difference in mean mile times between the two groups. Um, I'm going to come back to this sec, but I wanted to emphasize what the standard error is dependent on. It's dependent on the variability within each sample, the standard deviation, as well as the sample size. So if I had a higher sample size, the standard error would tend to go down. So that's food for thought. Okay, so um, moving forward. Now, in order to get us the probability of error, the p-value, uh, you know, if you're using a software tool such as SPSS or R or SAS, the p-value is it's automatically will be provided for you. So if you're my undergrad, you don't have to do any of this manual uh, math, if you will. But it's, it helps to understand how that p-value is extracted based on our sample data. So what I show you here is the t-distribution. And it's essentially the same curve that I just showed you that resembles a normal distribution here, but is standardized by the standard error. So again, stability shoe uh, is represented by a negative number. Uh, the cushioning shoe is faster when it's, it's a positive number. A t-score is a standardized score for the difference in mean mile times in functions of the standard error. And um, it ultimately provides us the probability of observing a result of negative 10 seconds when the null hypothesis is true. So take a look at the formula here. It's really straightforward. It's the observed score, in this case it would be negative 10 seconds, minus the null score, which is zero, divided by the standard error. So it's the function of both the effect, how far it is away from the null, as well as the variability. So the higher the variability, the closer that observed score is to null effect. What we want to know is that effect that we get of negative 10 seconds, is it rare enough that we can con safely conclude that it's different from what's happening in the population as a whole? Right? Is it far enough away from the uh, the null effect of zero, the null value of zero? And that can be determined by this t score. This t um, yeah, that's the t distribution score here. So I plug in the numbers. Negative 10 minus zero divided by 5.7, which is a standard error that we found in the previous slide. And I found that a score of negative 10 seconds in this sample is 1.75 standard error units below this null value of zero. Is that statistically significant? Well, I have to look it up in a t-table. Let's call a t-table um, based on the degrees of freedom in our sample size as well as this t-value. And what we found is the probability of error or p-value is 0 0.057. What that means is that in our results here, we found that there's a difference of negative 10 seconds. That means stability shoes faster by 10 seconds at least. So we think the probability of observing that result in our, our sample or in a sample that's drawn from the population in which the null hypothesis is true is 5.7%. Another way you can think of it, and hopefully this makes sense, if running shoe has no effect on mile times, the chance of getting a result of negative 10 seconds or faster is 5.7%. What we want to know, is that enough evidence for us to reject the null hypothesis that there is no effect on mile time? We have to compare it to something. So we compare that to what's known as the alpha level, as I mentioned earlier. And in this case, we use an alpha level of 
0 0.05, 0 0.05, which is defined a priori, which is just a fancy word of saying that it was done before data was collected. And because 5.7 is obviously greater than 5.0%, we have to conclude that we do not have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is no statistical significant difference between stability and cushioning issues in average mean times. Now, does that mean that they, they really have no effect? No, it just means that according to our sample, because of the uncertainty and because of the sample size, um, the probability of observing that results of 10 seconds in another sample that's drawn from the same population in which the null hypothesis is true is only 5.7%. If we were to collect the data and perhaps increase the sample size, we may actually find uh, a, a p-value lower than 0 0.05. So this is a perfect illustration how, in terms of significant testing, the only thing you can really answer is the likelihood, the probability of observing uh, or making that observation if the null hypothesis was true in the, in the population itself. Now, why is this all important? Um, when we set our alpha level, what we're trying to do is minimize what's known as a type 1 error, which, you know, the analogy that some people like to use is a false positive. When you're saying that there is an effect, when in reality there isn't. When you're saying that um, mile times differ between running shoe, uh, between stability and cushioning shoe, when in reality they don't. And the way you control uh, for that type of error, that's called a type 1 error or an alpha error, is by setting your significance level or alpha level low enough uh, where you, you minimize the risk of committing that type of error. Um, so that's how researchers would do it. And, and in fact, the way you would do it as a researcher is you set your alpha level prior to collecting data. The other type of data is what's known as a type 2 error, and that's the other way around when you're saying that there is no difference between groups or that there is no relationship between variables when in reality there is. That's called a type 2 or beta error, or what some people like to call a false negative. That's more in line when, you know, to what I call or what I cover in statistical power, in statistical power analysis, and that determines the, um, the probability of finding uh, a result of significance. So anyway, that's uh, for a, a separate video. So the overall, overall process in which we conduct a hypothesis-driven research study in terms of inferential stats is we develop a research hypothesis about some relationship between variables. This could be association between variables or differences between groups. We always state the null hypothesis. In fact, the null hypothesis in any research study is the status quo. What we're trying to do with our data is determine whether or not that's, that null hypothesis can be rejected. You know, it's kind of like going to court, you presume innocent until proven guilty. Right? So same thing, do we have enough evidence in our data to prove or to uh, confidently state that the null hypothesis can be rejected? Uh, once you have a null hypothesis, you obviously will have an alternative hypothesis that there is some relationship between variables or differences between groups. You gather data, you analyze the data, and then you make a decision on the probability of observing that result that's either as extreme or more extreme as the one you observe in your sample, given the true null hypothesis, right? That's what that p-value gives you. Okay, you know, what type of statistical tests do we run? Um, I, I save the details on each one of these tests for a separate uh, uh, lecture. But it largely depends on the independent variable the, the, and the dependent variable, the types and the, the levels. You can see here the number of different uh, types of statistical or inferential statistical tests. If you got both variables that are nominal or categorical in nature, we use a chi-square. If you're just comparing two groups with a dependent variable being continuous, we use a t-test. If you're using the same group tested twice, you use a dependent t-test. And in more than two groups, you know, one way and over is just one factor, two way and over, you have two factors anyway. You know, all all of those details are highlighted in a separate video. Um, when you are in a position to design a, a study, you, you want to formulate your hypotheses. You want to formulate the variables that operation define those hypotheses, uh, determine whether or not they're nominal or continuous in nature, um, look at normality of the, the distribution uh, of the data that you've collected, and then determine the type of 
of statistical tests um, that would be appropriate in testing that hypothesis. So I have here kind of a, a decision tree that we use in statistics. It, you don't need to learn all this right now or memorize all this. This is purely for your own reference. And again, it depends on research questions, uh, the type uh, of a dependent and independent variable, both the number and the type. Uh, are there any covariates involved? the tests that involve and the ultimate goal of that statistical analysis. So anyway, that is for your own reference there. So what are the common research designs that we use in kinesiology? Well, you know, this is probably a, co a common one. Uh, looking at the relationship between variables. Looking at the relationship, for example, uh, between um, um, BMI or BIA and BODPOD in measuring percentage of fat-free mass or fat mass, right? Uh, predicting a variable. Uh, predicting VO to max based on heart, uh, heart rate, age, gender, weight. I'm sure you've uh, used skin folds, for example, to estimate someone's body composition. That is an example of a, a regression. Uh, looking at differences between groups, um, between conditions, as I mentioned, independent t-tests and dependent t-tests. Um, if there are more than one group or more than one time point, then we use what's called an analysis of variance. For example, measuring um, hamstring flexibility between basketball, volleyball, and tennis players. You use a one-way ANOVA. Um, you can use uh, between uh, more than what, three conditions or three plus conditions. That's a one-way repeated measures ANOVA, where we're just looking at over time. Say, for example, looking at hamstring flexibility week one, three, six in a six weeks Pilates program. Or we can use a multifactorial ANOVA, where you have more than one independent variable. A perfect example is a randomized control trial, where we're looking at measuring a dependent variable, an outcome measure, over time, say at time 0, time 1, time 2, time 3, and determining if there are any differences in, you know, that longitudinal study between different groups. So I'm comparing between a treatment group and a control group and watching them over time. That's called an RCT or an randomized control trial. A control trial. One, probably one of the most common designs that we see not just in kinesiology but in you know all different branches of science and it's what a number of what's called level 1b evidence, scientific evidence, is um, are, are typically collected and analyzed. See, so real quickly on 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 p values, it's very important to note that not to overvalue p values. They're 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 only as good as their interpretation, and unfortunately, they often get misinterpreted. What I have here is a list of um, characteristics of p values that is defined by the American Statistical Association. Um, you know, this range from p-values can indicate how incompatible the data, the observed data, is with the specified statistical model, in this case the null hypothesis. And the rest of this is some of the common misinterpretations of p-values. Um, do not measure the probability um, that the study hypothesis is true. That's the alternative hypothesis. Nor do they measure the probability of the data um, happens by chance. Very important distinction. I often find students say that the p-value gives the probability that what you say happens by chance. No, it gives you the probability of observing a result that if the null hypothesis was true, um, actually occurs if you were to repeat that that study multiple times, right? As we covered that as that. And the rest of these, are, you know, uh, you know, I, I trust that you will look over each one of these and get a better idea on what a p-value is and how they should be interpreted. So that being said, we talked a lot about statistical significance, but statistical significance does not necessarily mean clinical significance. What I mean by is the data you're getting the results that you get from your study clinically relevant, clinically meaningful. So the p-values doesn't tell the whole story. As I mentioned, it just gives you the probability of an observed effect. The effect size is measured somewhere, is measured differently, right? As I, in, I mentioned earlier in the study, the effect size was simply a difference in mean times. It could also be the, uh, the correlation, or what we call shared variance. So there are different ways to measure your effect size, and p-value is not one of them, okay? Uh, another thing too is that uh, 
sa uh, studies that have high sample sizes tend to result in small effect size being detected. In other words, you can reach statistical significance where p is less than 0 0.05 if you have a high enough sample size. Remember when I talked about standard errors and talked about the t distribution? Those are dependent in the uncertainty in the sample um, or in the population from which that sample has drawn. So it's dependent on both variability, standard deviation, as well as the sample size. So the higher the sample size, lower that standard error, aka the uncertainty will be in that data. So at some point, yes, you have a high enough sample size, you'll get a p-value that's significant. In fact, it's completely useless at that point. Uh, so here's one example. This is a study that looked at, um, gosh, I think it was over 20,000 women and looked at their weight gains um, in between three groups. The uh, three groups were, I believe, low intensity exercise, uh, moderate e intensity exercise, and high intensity exercise, both both intensity as well as, as frequency. And they compared their weight gains over time. And what they found is a, a statistical significant difference in weight gains between all three groups. What's interesting, however, is that the um, weight that was actually gained was 0.26 pounds, less than what in, in the high group than it was in the low and moderate group. That means over time, you can look here, and we're just looking at, say, first the first three years, and you compare the slope, that's 0.26 pounds. That's, that's less than a half a pound in three years. So yes, it's statistically significant, but is it clinically significant? Is it clinically meaningful? And I would argue, obviously, just based on these results, it's not. Right? In fact, if you were to extrapolate this out to 13 years, you would still have less than a pound gain. That's it. So anyway, um, knowing whether there is a difference is not enough. We have to determine whether that effect, the size of the effect, is clinically meaningful. And if you take an evidence-based pra evidence practice course, or if you're a clinician, you'll understand about the research on measuring what's known as the um, um, a minimal uh, clinical meaningful result or, or change or difference. And I'll leave with this quote from uh, Huff's uh, book on how to lie with statistics. A difference is a difference only if it makes a difference. Okay.